Duke University Medical School and serves as the Associate Division Chief for Research in the Division of Children's Primary Care at Duke University. He prepares and gives evidence-based summaries for the Secretary's Advisory Committee, and he'll be speaking today on newborn screening for MPS-1, rationale and evidence. Thank you very much for that um, kind introduction. So, you want me to be even closer? So, as, as much as I like to be the um, center of attention, I also recognize that one of the most important things about this meeting is the opportunity for you to um, develop new collaborations and talk to old friends. So I'm gonna go through this. Oh, I'm getting a new microphone. I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly, and if anybody wants to talk to me about this further, I can find them over at the, uh, at the cash bar. But it, it's, it's gonna cost you. Um, so, uh, you know, it's funny, we're working right now on our review of excellent adrenal leukodystrophy, so it's a little hard for me to change uh, gears and go back to uh, MPS-1. Um, as many of you know, um, the Secretary's Advisory Committee just um, recommended to the Secretary that MPS-1 gets added to the recommended uniform screening panel, the so-called RUSP, and the next step uh, after that is it goes to some uh, interagency coordinating council, which is um, uh, members of the HHS that meet in some bunker underneath a volcano somewhere where they um, make a, they come back with a recommendation to the secretary. So that's where things stand right now. Um, uh, uh, these are the people that work with me. I have, I'm lucky enough to have the, the greatest crew of uh, people you could ever hope to work with. Um, I'm going to take it that many of you know about uh, mucopolysaccharidosis um, uh, type 1, and so again, I'm going to go through this quickly. Um, it's an a autosomal recessive li li uh, lysosomal storage disorder. It's uh, progressive, uh, like many of the other uh, conditions that are screened for. It has um, variable uh, clinical symptoms. I'm going to go over that uh, uh, in a second. and. Prior to the initiation of any screening, our estimate was that it was going to affect about one in 100,000 uh, people. You saw Dr. Uh, Rogers' slide uh, earlier with what's actually going on in Missouri, which we'll, I'll touch on briefly. Um, MPS-1 can be divided up, uh, 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 depending upon your view of the world, uh, into either a severe form or an attenuated form, uh, or the, as it's typically called, uh, Hurler syndrome. Hurler-Shea or Shea syndrome, and that sort of covers the, uh, the, the spectrum. Uh, when we talk about newborn screening, we're really talking about screening for the um, severe form. Uh, 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 you can tell by the name, the severe form is uh, severe. One of the things that distinguishes the severe form from the uh, attenuated forms is the uh, uh, involvement of the, um, uh, of the brain. And although there's an enzyme replacement therapy that's available for MPS-1, uh, one of the problems is it doesn't penetrate the blood-brain barrier. And so the treatment for um, the severe form of MPS-1 uh, involves uh, uh, stem cell transplantation. Uh, and depending upon how it's done, sometimes enzyme replacement therapy is used around the time of um, uh, transplantation. I told you I'm going to go through this quickly. Uh, so newborn screening is um, based on the identification of low enzyme uh, activity in dry blood spots. There are different ways of doing it. You can identify it through uh, tandem mass spec, and there are different ways of doing that. And it can also be detected um, by fluorometry using digital microfluidics. That's what they're using in Missouri right now. Um, establishing the, the diagnosis um, uh, is based on confirming the fact that the enzyme activity level is low. You can look at glycosaminoglycans uh, in the urine, which um, when they're elevated, it's supportive of the diagnosis. Um, genotyping can be helpful, but the problem is there are many um, uh, variations of the, of the gene, and so it's, it doesn't always give you the um, uh, answer if it's a private mutation, and really a lot of this relies on uh, clinical assessment, which of course, you know, makes this difficult because these are rare conditions and many clinicians don't have 
uh, experience with MPS1 or certainly MPS1 presenting presymptomatically in the newborn period. Um, there are lots of different uh, uh, variants, um, and one of the things that makes this condition challenging is that there are also variants that are associated with um, pseudo-deficiency. Uh, treatment, again, I talked about that uh, involving either stem cell transplantation or uh, enzyme replacement therapy. Uh, here's an algorithm that's sort of typical for how things are done, which is, again, I'm, uh, looking uh, at low enzyme activity level in a dry blood spot, repeating it in the same dry blood spot if it's low, recalling the, um, uh, the newborn, getting another dry blood spot, and then proceeding with genotyping and so forth. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you that the, the best data I think right now available in the United States is, is available from Missouri because that's where they're actually doing the screening. I've listed up uh, here uh, some of the Taiwan and uh, the uh, Italian uh, experience, but again, these are based on small numbers. I've listed up here the uh, University of Washington study. The problem with the University of Washington um, study is that it's uh, based on um, anonymized dry blood spots, so it's not really a pilot because you can't follow it with the, um, uh, with the baby to find out what was exactly going on. So it's really the Missouri data that are the most compelling. I didn't list up here the most recent data from uh, Missouri because I didn't know it, but fortunately Dr. Rogers presented before me. And one of the problems with newborn screening for MPS1 is did anybody notice the positive predictive value from the uh, screen test? All right, it was 1.2%. So that means that of the babies who test positive, 1% will go on to have uh, uh, MPS1. The, there are many reasons why the positive predictive value is low. So it's a rare condition. Even if you have a highly specific test, if you're talking about a rare condition, you're going to generate a lot of false positives. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is that it um, turns out that the prevalence of pseudodeficiency is higher than what was um, initially anticipated. Um, and it, uh, as Dr. Rogers mentioned, the uh, individuals with pseudodeficiency don't have uh, disease, but they test positive because uh, as a, just the nature of the way the test works, um, it looks like they have the um, condition. You can tell I'm a general pediatrician when I start talking that way, but basically it happens, but they're well. Um, I'm going to skip this again in the interest of getting you uh, to, um, to the cash bar. <laughs> so. I'm going to just actually jump up and show uh, two slides. If you look at the expected survival from clinically detected cases versus cases detected through newborn screening, um, newborn screening is not expected to confer an advantage in terms of mortality. So unlike many of the other conditions that are included in newborn screening, if you look at the evidence and some modeling that we've done as well, again, we don't, you know, this is all predictive based on small numbers. We don't think that newborn screening is going to prolong life for these affected individuals. But what it will do is um, it can preserve um, developmental outcome. And of course, preserving developmental outcome over the life of the affected individual um, uh, can obviously confer uh, many benefits. And so, Without going through the details of this slide, um, these are curves for uh, uh, cognitive, adaptive, uh, receptive language, and expressive language, with the um, uh, darker line reflecting those individuals who got treated earlier, and the, the yellow and the reds um, progressively later. Just, uh, and again, these are small numbers that this is all based on, but, but pointing to the fact that the early in, earlier intervention um, has significant effect on development. Here's another slide that actually follows individuals through through their trajectory. So I don't, did anybody actually listen in to the advisory committee um, deliberations when, the, when this was up all like 20 hours? It, it, it felt like, um, it was like watching like a, a BBC miniseries with, you know, like long slow plot. Um, when you look at these data regarding cognitive outcomes, 
um, especially when they're retrospective and you look at individuals who got treated earlier versus individuals who got treated later, it's really hard to know for sure whether or not it's the early intervention that made a difference because you don't know if there's something different that allowed these babies who you know, got the clinical detection early, if, if there was something that was, was driving that. And if you look um, across populations, the biggest predictor of early cognitive outcome is um, the family's social economic status. Um, and there are a million other confounders. When I say confounders, are, I'm specifically referring to things that, that can interfere with the association that you're looking at. None of those studies report um, uh, that uh, level of detail. And even if they did, there's nothing you could really do about it because when the sample size is so small, you can't really adjust for these different factors. So that's really what uh, led to a prolonged discussion about this. In the end, um, the evidence was sufficiently compelling to the um, uh, uh, advisory committee um, that, that preservation of cognitive outcomes was likely to be a benefit of early detection. And um, uh, we have lots of modeling. If you want to look at projections of what happens and you know, what would be expected to happen if you were to screen all four million babies born in the United States, this is the slide and I'm going to be over there and you can talk to me and we can pull out the data and talk about it. Um, but the, um, let me just highlight some key things, some, some little uh, 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 facts that I think that, that makes sense to know about uh, MPS ones. First of all, the birth prevalence is about one in 100,000. Uh, most cases of MPS one that are going to be detected are going to be in the severe form. Um, screening can identify MPS one and it works. Um, uh, uh, thanks to the work that Missouri has done in the United States, I, I, I feel like we can say that. Uh, there are different competing screening uh, methods. We don't know which one's best. Um, lots of false positives, low positive predictive value. We talked about that. Uh, early detection of MPS1 is likely to help with these cognitive uh, outcomes. Um, in terms of the attenuated form, uh, which we didn't talk about, um, it's nearly impossible now to predict when symptoms are going to develop. And um, it's unclear, again, like all these late onset diseases, exactly when you um, uh, begin to treat. So that's, that's going to be a complicated thing to figure out. The advisory committee actually gave this a B. And um, originally, it was going to be things that were in the A category that were going to be added to the um, uh, recommended universal screening panel. They gave it a B because of modern, modern certainty around the benefit of screening. But they, it was sufficiently compelling that they thought that it should be added to the um, uh, uh, recommended, universal, recommended uniform screening panel. Um, we didn't talk about feasibility of implementation, but from other work, it seems like this is something that can be adopted within the next few years in states if states had the uh, interest and wherewithal to do it. What I can't tell you, and it's going to be very interesting to watch, is what the Secretary's response to this is going to be, because the level of evidence really is lower than other things that have been added to the RUSP. And again, this is something where it's not anticipated to affect survival, but it to affect cognitive outcomes. So in many ways, MPS1 is different than the other things that have been recently added to the recommended uniform screening panel. So we're all just going to have to sit back and see what happens. And with that, I will end. <laughs>